This is um, how to win an argument by Marcus Tutila Cicero. Um, and I'm just trying to make my way through this book. Um, I had it laying around at home and I figured um, why not read it for the channel and why not share it with one of my um, friends, I guess, um, uh, through Discord, um, which is how I operate the channel. Um, I've already uh, made my way through parts of the book with them, um, and I'm currently in the middle of reading the beginning of the book. And I haven't read the introduction and the preface yet. Um, so I'm going to read it for the channel. And um, I guess this will be a part of the first uh, video recording for this book. Um, these episodes will be quite long, um, uh, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, I've begun to read the the book already, like I said, and um, while reading the beginning, sort of this part of the book, the origins of eloquent and persuasive speech. I found myself uh, disagreeing with Cicero on some points, but not exactly able to articulate as to why I disagreed. Um, but still, nonetheless, um, I find it to, I find this uh, sort of exploration of, I guess, uh, philosophy, um, this sort of exploration of thinking, I guess, is helpful, and I find it to be, on some level, I find it to be entertaining. So I hope to be able to share that with everyone with the book club, and also explore that for myself. So I'll just begin reading. For as long as human beings have had the ability to communicate, we have endeavored to persuade one another, whether it be for the purposes of mere survival, or to control the circumstances of our lives, or to bring someone around to our way of thinking, or merely to win an argument. We have relied on some sort of persuasion either physical force or what we would consider more civilized means of speaking and writing to accomplish our goals and purposes. The art of verbal persuasion in a word, rhetoric, was discovered in the West in the democracies of Syracuse and Athens during the 5th century BC, citizens in democratic, democratic societies were expected to express themselves in assembly, represent themselves in courts of law, and participate in other civic functions. As a result, in order to enable people to operate successfully in society, Attempts were made to describe effective means of verbal persuasion and theoretical systems and, and, oh. and a theoretical system evolved that enabled citizens to plan and execute a successful speech in public. In other words, to win an argument. Um, that's that, that's sort of the, the beginning of what I've, I've read already. I'm, I'm familiar with this already. And like I said, there are some parts that I disagree with, but 
uh, I'll just continue reading. Several centuries later, Rome's greatest orator and one of the greatest speakers of all time, Marcus Tutelus Cicero, secured Rome's highest political office, the consulship. Having relied heavily on this art of verbal persuasion to make a name for himself in Roman society. Trained from boyhood in the technicalities of rhetoric, Cicero excelled not only as an effective public speaker who won the vast majority of arguments in which he was involved, but also as a theorist in the art of verbal persuasion. Having written during his lifetime several treatises that have rhetoric as their subject, and although he is highly critical of the typical rhetoric handbooks of the day, he was nonetheless steeped in their doctrine and reliant upon their methods. In fact, this rhetorical education for civic duty handed down by the Greeks and adopted by the Romans, remained a primary element in the training of all, edu people, all ed educated people throughout the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance, and even down into modern times. Um, let's see, I want to know when this book was published. Um, 2016 by Princeton University Press. Okay. Um, uh, continuing with the book. Given the centrality of rhetoric, that is, the art of verbal persuasion, in our Western tradition, I present here a short anthology of passages from Cicero's writings primarily his rhetorical treatises that capture the essence of this ancient rhetorical system of persuasion, a system that helped to make Cicero and countless other orators effective speakers, able to convince people and win arguments. Readers will, I hope, find these selections interesting in their own right as well as useful when thinking about their own efforts to persuade. Indeed, whether arguing with a friend over a trivial issue or presenting a brief before the Supreme Court, the goal of a speaker is still to persuade. And knowing the most effective means of persuasion in any given circumstance will lead to the successful realization of that goal. A peculiar paradox of contemporary American society is that at a time when we find many schools, colleges, and universities talking seriously about fostering oral com competency and good communication skills in their students, we actually see very few effective public speakers in action in the courts, in our communities, or in the public arena of political life. While this book is certainly not intended to remedy that situation, my hope is that those who think about speaking in public and want to win arguments will find it appealing and will delight in the realization that the techniques for oral, effective oral persuasion discovered and enunciated millennia ago still make sense and have great relevance for those who would speak convincingly today. Um, that's really the, the heart of the book, and that's why I'm interested in it, is the tradition that's being outlined, that's being passed down through schools, and the exactly what is it that is valuable for 
um, for 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 me exactly. Um, um, and that's pretty much why I'm interested is being able to trace down um, the things that people pass down throughout time and what can I find in it for myself. Um, obviously I have to do that very carefully because um, any given person I would say has their own perspective and their own uh, mission um, so I would try to keep that in mind as I read other people's words and listen to what they have to say um, obviously those are very that's a very um, loaded statement that would probably take some time to explain but um, nonetheless I see things a certain way and I hope to be able to um, let's say um, learn from other people that's that's really um, what I hope and in doing so I hope to be able to share what I've learned with other people and to teach people new things um, that's really what I desire um, but I will continue reading the book in order to simplify matters and allow for a smoother reading I have avoided appending footnotes to names and terms that might present challenges to readers who are unfamiliar with the historical period or the technical subject matter. Um, for some reason, uh, during my recording and reading this book halfway through, um, the audio in the recording seems to cut in and out um, uncontrollably and I have no way to remedy the situation and I don't necessarily feel like recording the video um, no uh, recording the um, I don't feel like recording the reading again um, in order to uh, fix fix it um, the rest of the I guess I'll I'll summarize the rest of the reading um, for anyone that wants to stop watching the video here and not listen to the audio while it's messing up um, I just continue to read the names and things like that for the book at the end where the editor, the translator gives credit to people who've helped them. Um, then I continue to read Cicero's life, a brief sketch without which outlines Cicero's life, sort of as he was growing up, the influences around him, his career, his achievements, um, and then his death. Um, which is quite, um, I would say, um, I would say he had an eventful life. I would say that. Um, and things like that. And at the end, I, I guess I summarize it by saying that Cicero is basically um, for for what it's worth, uh, uh, 
a politician and a lawyer. And that's what I saw. That's what I got out of it. Um, uh, but I will continue to read the book. Um, if this interests you, uh, I am considering scanning and uploading this book to the Internet Archive. So if you feel like waiting, uh, I'm sure I will find a way to make it available to anyone listening to this. Um, but um, as far as that's concerned, I will allow the audio to play and you may listen to it if if the audio sort of stuttering doesn't bother you at all. Um, but other than that, that's the end of the video. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, I guess I'll say it again. I'll say read more books. In lieu of two of notes, a glossary of names and terms has been included near the end of the volume, to which the reader can refer when seeking more detailed information and clarification. In addition, a list of suggestions for further reading on the subject has also been appended, consisting of both primary works by Cicero in English translation, as well as secondary works that elucidate and comment upon ancient rhetoric and oratory, Cicero and his works. All translations except those from the orator are my own. The orator passages were previously translated jointly by my colleague Jacob Wizzy and me, and appeared originally in our complete translation of the treatise published by Oxford University Press in 2001. Occasionally, I have altered a word or two of that original translation in the passages that appear here. I would like to thank Mr. Robert Campio, executive editor of and Humanities Group Publisher from Princeton University Press, for suggesting this volume to me and for his guidance and direction in seeing it through to publication. And Sarah Linear, Senior Production Editor, I do a debt of gratitude also to my copy editor, Jennifer Harris, and to the anonymous referees of the press, whose corrections, observations, and suggestions have improved the manuscript greatly. I dedicate this little book to Augustus James Mary May in hopes that they, that as he grows in age and wisdom, he will realize the ideal of the elder Cato, becoming a rear bonus descendi Heretius, a good man skilled in speaking. James M. May. St. Olaf College. Um, there it is. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, I guess. Um, I will, uh, in a moment, read the, the next part, Cicero's Life with Free Sketch. Marcus Tigella Cicero was born on 3rd of January, 106 BC, in Arpinium, a town of approximately 70 miles southeast of Rome, to a family that, though not members of the Roman nobility, was prominent in the local community and had important connections in the, in the capital. While Marcus and his brother, Quintus, were still boys, the family moved to Rome. 
I moved, aimed at advancing the education and prospects of the brothers. There, the boys were brought into contact with two leading orators of the day, Lucius Licinius, Crassus, and Marcus Antonius, who were later to become the two chief speakers in Cicero's greatest rhetorical treatise, a dialogue on the ideal orator de orator. In such an environment, from boyhood on, Cicero was able to observe Rome's leading speakers and statesmen operating on a daily basis in the courts and in the forum after Crassus' death in 91 BC. Cicero, at the age of 15 or 16, assumed the toga of manhood. Um, I guess take a note of that. Um, I'm assuming if you're watching this on YouTube, you can go ahead and Google that. Um, I certainly will. Um, and was formally introduced to Quintus Musinius Scott Evola, the augur, one of Rome's greatest legal experts, who is also given a place as one of the speakers in the oratory. Under his tutelage, Cicero acquired his enormous respect and knowledge of the civil law. The young Cicero was no doubt a precocious student in addition to his oracle and legal studies. With Crassus, Antonius, and Scaevola, he developed an interest in an abiding love for philosophy. While still a teenager, he published his first rhetorical work, De Inventione, or On Invention, which which, in later years, he would describe as the sketchy and unsophisticated work that found its way out of my notebooks when I was a boy, or rather a youth. Though even that work continued to exert a tremendous influence on rhetorical and oratorical studies throughout the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. Um, here you can sort of see uh, the pieces of history being left behind. Um, obviously, the question is, why then was this chosen? Um, was it the merit of the work, um, which Cicero denies, or was it a desire to revive um, older customs which they believed at the time to have certain value. Um, or let's say was uh, and I'm speaking of the Middle Ages here uh, and the Renaissance or was it a desire to sort of revitalize older traditions, things like that. Um, but obviously, uh, there's only so much you can gather from what is what amounts to a few sentences. But I feel like there is things to be understood. Um, obviously, when I hear about a teenager uh, writing something like this and it being passed down through generations. Um, you know, I believe the word people use is a cringe. Um, I certainly would not hold myself to that word, but at the same time, um, 
there is value in people's words, and there is value, so to speak, in even a teenager's words. But is that value there, or is it like, is the value sort of added onto it after the fact? And for what reason? Um, those are certainly the questions that I would be asking, that I am asking right now. Um, but nonetheless, um, I will continue to read um, and see what I can understand. Um, after a brief tour of military service during the war with the uh, Italian allies, Cicero returned to Rome that day during the decade of the 80s BC. It was largely torn apart by civil strife, bloodshed, and fraud prescription, sort of like military service, brought by the conflict between the strong arms of Marius, Sinna, and Sulla. When some sense of order had finally been restored and the courts began to function again regular, regularly, Cicero took up his first civil cases to be followed in ADBC by his criminal case. His defense of Rosius of Amira on a charge of parasite, parasite, shortly after this impressive victory, he decided to continue his education by spending about two years on what amounted to a grand tour of Greece where he met, interacted, and studied with several prestigious rhetoricians, rhetoricians, hmm. or actors, oh, orators, and philosophers. He returned to Rome in 77 BC, a more vigorous and refined speaker. Cicero was now nearly 30 years old, and minimum age requirement for standing for the office of Quaestor, a sort of public treasurer or paymaster. As mentioned earlier, his family was not numbered among the Roman nobility. None of them before him had become a Roman senator by virtue of being elected to public office. Thus, a so-called new man, Nobus Homo, Cicero found himself in a notably disadvantaged political position seeing that election to the higher magistrates at Rome was jealously guarded by and generally restricted to members of the no this nobility rank. Nonetheless, he managed to win the election, finishing first on the ballot and in his first eligible year, and served as quaestor in Sicily. The connections he forged there accrued to his benefit five years later, when the Sicilians, recalling his good upright and, and upright service, enlisted him to prosecute Gaius Verses, the corrupt governor 
of the island from 73 to 70 BC on a charge of extortion. His stunning success in the case against the power of the senatorial order and Hernesius or Hortensius, the famous advocate of the day, who was defending Verice, catapulted Cicero into the limelight of Rome's leading orator and advocate. Other political offices followed for Cicero. Ideally, a praetor, and finally a consul, the highest magistrate in Republican Rome. Um, yeah, I'm starting to think it's like a look of the glossary, but I guess I'll skim over those words, I guess. Um, yeah, so it seems like Cicero was what amounted to uh, a politician and a lawyer. Um, <laughs> if you think about it now, would you, uh, would, would a politician's or lawyer's book be so interesting in today's time? Probably not. Um, but nonetheless, I continue to read. During the final months of Cicero's year, as consul in 663 BC, he uncovered a plot to overthrow the government, led by a revolutionary, bankrupt senator of noble descent, Le Luci Lucius Sergius Petalini. Though his diligence the assistance of the informants and his inspiring oratory, students of Latin will be familiar with the justly famous Catilarian orations. Cicero managed to thwart the coup and, with the threat still imminent, to gain approval of Senate over the objections of some for execution of the conspirators without a trial. In the aftermath, a public thanksgiving was decreed and Cicero was hailed as Pastor Patria, father of the fatherland. Hmm. In this moment of triumph, when he had seemingly managed to unite the Roman people against the threat of coup, Cicero envisioned a harmony among the various social classes of Rome, a concordia ordinarium. No, concordia ordinum. Only a few years later, however, forces would conspire to dash that dream and to transform the source of Cicero's crowning glory to one of debilitating disgrace. In 60 BC, various maneuverings and politi political machinations had fostered an alliance between three powerful men, Julius Caesar, the great general Pompey, and the wealthy Marcus Crassus, a distant relative of Cicero's boyhood mentor. Although initially invited to join the coalition, Cicero ultimately could not bring himself to, to support this so-called first trium triumvirate, and they, in turn, were content to give free reign to his opponents, chief of whom was his arch enemy, the tribune Plubin. Plu no. Plu Publius. Clodius, who managed to force him into exile in 58 BC for executing Roman citizens without a trial. 
uh, taking refuge in Greece, Cicero endured the most miserable year and a half of his life, during which he suffered acute depression and even contemplated suicide. The Senate recalled him in triumph in 50 BC, in 57 BC, but the triumph years still held sway in Rome and warned Cicero, though the agency of his brother, uh, Quintus, not to pursue any policy hostile to their interests. In fact, at the behest of the triumvirs, he was even forced against his will to defend several of his former enemies. In this sort of repressive environment, Cicero turned to writing and spent the last several years of the decade composing some of his important and significant literary treatises, including the Orator, the Republica, and the Ligubis. The Ligubis. In 51 BC, Cicero was assigned by the Senate to serve a pro-council on the province of Sicilia in Asia Minor, modern southwest Turkey, where he executed his duties honorably, restoring order and even undertaking a brief but very successful military campaign against some warring hill tribes. The political situation back in Rome had been deteriorating for several years. The triumvir, Crassus, had been killed on military campaign in Partha in 53 BC. And the relationship between the remaining triumvirs, Caesar and Pompey, was fast approaching a breaking point. Only a few weeks following Cicero's return to Rome from his governance, governorship, governorship in Sicilia, full-scale civil war broke out in January 49 BC. Much af after much hesitation, personal deliberation, and a failed attempt to reconcile Caesar and Pompey. Cicero eventually joined the Republican forces under the command of Pompey in Greece. But following their defeat at Barcelos in 48 BC, he returned to Italy and after another stretch of agonizing certainty, uh, was among those pardoned by Caesar and permitted to retain in country others in the Republican cause, including Cato, the younger, fought on. During the ensuing dictatorship of Caesar, Cicero again saw his opportunities for playing a significant role in the public arena greatly curtailed. Moreover, the tragic death of his beloved daughter, Tulia, and 50 and all. Moreover, the tragic death of his beloved daughter, Tulia, in 45 BC, forced, for, uh, forced him further into withdrawal and near despair, as he had done a decade earlier in forced retirement. He turned to writing as he searched for consolation, and during this period of during this period composed a remarkable number of rhetorical and philosophical works, including Brutus Orator, the Finibus Bornorum. 
Kylo Ren. On moral ends. Two. Skullin. Disputations. And de natural de oral. On the nature of the gods. While not directly involved in the assassination of Julius Caesar on the Ides of March 44 BC, Cicero viewed it as an opportunity for the Republic to rise again from its ashes. But the subsequent actions of Mark Antony, one of Caesar's closest friends and his colleague in the court council's chair that year, soon led Cicero to fear that Rome had merely substituted one tyrant for another, taking up what would be his final and perhaps most courageous cause. He managed to rally the people and the Senate of Rome through a series of speeches that he called um, Philippics, likening them to their title to the speeches that the great Greek orator Demosthenes had delivered 300 years earlier against Philip II of Macedon. But in the end, Cicero's hopes of a restored republic were dashed. When the young and ambitious grand nephew and heir of the Caesar, Octavian, later to be Caesar Augustus, joined forces with Antony and Marcus Aemilius Blipidus in a second triumvirate that immediately set about eliminating their opposition to control the state. Cicero's name appeared prominently on the list of the proscribed and after being hunted down near form, Formier, his head and hands were severed from his body by Antony's minions and brought back to Rome, and they were prominently displayed on the rostra. The speaker's platform, where Cicero has so often stood to address the Roman people. Cicero's enduring legacy stems largely from his writings. In fact, we know more about Cicero than perhaps any other person of antiquity, largely owing to the vast corpus of his works that survive today. Nearly 60 of his speeches and ex and extant, as well as a score of his philosophical and rhetorical works, and almost a thousand personal letters. These writings have been valued from his days down to our own times, and provide for us the portrait of the man in all his dimensions. Orator, rhetorician, politician, philosopher, and patriot. Yeah. Um, like I said before, Cicero is a man of his time. And that certainly holds true. Um, yeah, and by that I mean, in another sense, um, Cicero may as well have been an exemplary person. Um, which is why I guess so many people listen to him, maybe. Or maybe people listen to him because people tell other people to listen to him. It's sort of a this or that sort of thing. Maybe. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. That's the introduction. This will be the ending of the first episode um, of the reading for How to Win an Argument by Cicero. Um, thank you for listening if you have. Surely this was a more than one hour recording. Um, but nonetheless, if this interests you, I will continue to read this book uh, to completion, and 
if you feel so inclined, you may watch the videos, which is why I'm putting them up on YouTube. Um, but that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And um, uh, read more books, uh, even if they are philosophy books that were written in ancient times.